Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks, Emil, for that intro. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm really waiting for those uh, self-driving cars. So, so I don't have to worry about morning traffic. Uh, I just be able to relax in my car, do some work, while the car takes care of all those uh, challenges uh, for me. <clears throat> so, and I can uh, work towards helping all of us, as he said, live to be 250 and productive, right? So, and I think all of us, you know, in the tech community will uh, over time join in that, you know, effort. We all need tune-ups as we go through our lives, right? Uh, modern medicine is one of the leading reasons why we enjoy these long, productive lives today. Uh, if you go back just a few generations, people didn't expect you know, the kind of lifespan we have. Uh, today, a 78-year-old says, oh, I'm trying to learn something new. I'm going jogging. It's unthinkable. It used to be unthinkable in the past, right? So, but if you uh, read uh, the New York Times op-ed about some biotech discovery, what, what does the fine print say? It's going to take 20 years to become a new medicine, right? Because the current process of finding drugs is really inefficient, and it's not working. And fixing that has a direct impact on all of our lives who live in the modern world, OK? So if you look at the business picture of this industry, OK, uh, look at what's happening to costs. Those keep going up, and the uh, new drug approvals keep falling. You don't need to know anything about uh, drugs or the biotech business or anything else, you look at that and you say, that business picture is, you know, really fraught with trouble. These guys did a very nice study, Scannell and Blankley, that published in Nature uh, Review Drug Discovery. They showed that the uh, pharma and the biotech industry, it goes in the reverse uh, direction as Moore's Law, okay? Every nine years, oh, we get R&D productivity to go down by a factor of two. In the last, you know, uh, 60 plus years since the 1950s, for every billion dollars spent, we have uh, seen an 80-fold decrease in productivity. You think about that, and you realize there is a fundamental systemic problem in this industry. So, uh, let's talk about why that is. Uh, how are drugs designed today, uh, and uh, what you uh, can do about it. But before we can do that, we should talk for a moment about what are drugs. What happens when you take that pill? Uh, the drug molecules dissolve in your gut, go through your bloodstream, and bind to some protein in your body and change their functions. This is how every drug works. Uh, our bodies are made of these proteins. They're giant molecules, 10,000 atoms, so you can draw them like ball and stick, like chemistry, high school chemistry sets that you have seen. Uh, and they form all your cell structures, but, but they're also involved in disease processes. Uh, the guy drawn in blue on the left could be some enzyme in my brain whose job is to go attach to other proteins and cut them up, and they form plaque in my brain, and eventually I'd get Alzheimer's. So what I want a drug to do is, uh, when I take the pill, I want the drug molecules to come, uh, uh, course through my bloodstream, find that protein, bind to it, and prevent it from doing that damage. This is how every drug works. Uh, from traditional remedies that have been handed down to us, uh, say, a lot of you know about Ayurvedic medicine and so forth, to today's modern pharmaceutical miracles. When you take them, they go bind to some proteins in your body and change their functions. So sitting in the 21st century, you ask yourself, why does that drug molecule bind to that protein? Turns out, at that level, it's actually a physics problem. The atoms on the drug and the atoms of the protein, they push and pull on each other. Uh, they form chemical bonds. The drug molecule flexes and twists around its chemical bonds like a tinker toy. And they form this perfect lock and key fit. So the next obvious question to ask is, like it says there, why can't you atom by atom design that perfect binder? Today, when you want to build the next big skyscraper, the architect comes, tells you exactly how uh, every room will look, where the load-bearing structures need to be. By the time you build it, it, you know, it works. If you take a, a transcontinental flight on a Boeing Dreamliner, uh, you rest easy knowing that it was designed completely on a computer. By the time they took it out, it flew, okay? Every component in your cell phone was designed on a computer, but drugs are not designed that way. So how does the industry find drugs today? Uh, you need massive infrastructure, armies of medicinal chemists and biologists doing a lot of trial and error experiments, which is why we see this you know, steady decline in R&D productivity. Uh, basically, the way the process works is you take that disease-causing protein and you put it in a pipette. 
uh, and dip it down into a bunch of chemicals that are made up and stored in the lab in small little test tubes in, in those holes, okay? And you're looking for a change in color or temperature. You say, aha, found a binder. Uh, there's, there's a fancy name for it. It's called high throughput screening. It uses a lot of robotics. But in the, at the end of the day, it's just trial and error. How many things can you test this way? If you're a massive pharmaceutical company like Pfizer, Novartis, Roche, you might have about 2 million compounds in your corporate collection. No matter what disease you're going after, you're testing the same 2 million compounds. You're just dipping, dipping a different protein in them. This is how today's drug discovery works. Across the whole industry, because these corporate collections and what biotechs can buy, they have huge overlaps, we're testing about 4 to 6 million compounds. You ask yourself, is 4 to 6 million a good enough number? To answer that question, you need to ask, what is a drug molecule? You can describe them by standard rules of organic chemistry. How many such things are actually possible based on the known rules of organic synthesis? People have done that estimate. Uh, that number is 10 to the 60. One with 60 zeros. Think about that. Okay? Now compare that to 4 to 6 million. You realize it's not even a tide pool by the side of an ocean that you're fishing in. It's a little droplet. What's even worse is that droplet isn't even as diverse as it should be. It's filled with Me Too compounds. Same backbone, same scaffold, repeating over and over with small little variations around the edges. So as a result, the industry is filled with Me Too drugs, okay? Uh, some guy comes up with a Vioxx. Uh, everybody else says, how do I get around their patent, come up with my own entrant? They all look very, very similar. They have the same side effects, same problem, same profile, and the same story repeats over and over with every other drug category, Lipitor, anything else you, think, uh, you can think of. So sometimes we joke that f the pharma industry is worse than Hollywood. Sequels of sequels of sequels is all you see, okay? So uh, if you collect up everything that we have synthesized today that we can test, all the natural products we have found, you know, and we have isolated and you know, put together that we test, uh, that constitutes that little dot by the side of the ocean. Everything else on the outside remains unexplored. That's today's drug discovery, okay? As a result, we fished out what we could. When we're lucky enough to find a binder, let's say it's this guy, you know, uh, on the edge that, you know, binds. Is that, the, uh, is that the final drug? No. You start feeding mice, and you see they turn blue or they die, and you say, okay, I got to do something. So what do you do for the next four years? First you might uh, crystallize the drug with the protein, meaning uh, put them in a test tube, make them react, dry them up into crystals, and shoot x-rays through it. Now you can see the 3D structure of the protein with the drug bound to it. What you, what you do next is uh, you put it up on your computer screen, and you uh, ask your medicinal chemist, if I attach a little tail at the edge, will it still fit? Okay? Or if I cut off this ring or fuse these two things, uh, will, it, uh, will it still bind? Uh, and sometimes you ask the computer, do you do a little bit of modeling? And you say, uh, ask it, will it still bind? Knowing full well that uh, most of the please, stay close to the microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, uh, knowing full well uh, that uh, most of the time, uh, what, uh, what the answer is going to give you is wrong. Okay? But it's better than nothing. So you use it as a business decision support system. So if you talk to somebody, they'll tell you, oh, I know of a company that uses computers in drug discovery. Uh, and uh, our pharma investors, they start laughing. They say, we all use computers in drug discovery. The question is how? Can we drive the design of completely novel molecules on the computer? The answer is absolutely not. With today's process, we have ended up with a, uh, with a situation where 45 programs you start today, uh, two-thirds of them, after four years of trial and error, don't pass animal testing. The other 15, you put them through clinical trials. Another six years later, uh, one of them might reach the market. Uh, literally, the whole thing takes about 11 to 12 years, five to ten uh, billion dollars in uh, accounting for all the failures, and no other industry would survive with these kinds of odds. So, here is a better process for drug discovery. We start by constructing that ocean of possibilities on the computer, virtually. Uh, that begs, begs the question, why doesn't Pfizer test, say, 200 million compounds in, the, in their lab? They have a lot of money, right? The answer is, there aren't enough chemists to make 200 million distinct chemical backbones in the next 200 years. The lab processes aren't going to scale up. So the only way to get there is virtually. Then you have to test it using computers and come up with uh, 
things that you couldn't find with current methods because these are things people didn't know to make, okay? So let's dig a little deeper. The first part starts with something called a molecule creation engine, is what we call it, okay? Uh, it's a proprietary uh, collection of building blocks. Think of them like Lego toy blocks, okay? Our system tells you what to start with to make each one of these in a small number of steps. And then it uses these to piece together final Lego toys or drug-like molecules. But every time it's doing that, it's taking into account thousands of reaction rules in the lab to make sure there is a process for making each one of these from start to finish. Other people have tried creating these kinds of ball and stick models before. Uh, literally connecting carbon to four things. You, have, you know, uh, those of you who have gone through uh, chemistry know, you know, valence of carbon and whatever else. But the point is, you ask them how to make it, they say, I don't know. So it becomes a completely useless exercise. This is the first time you have basically a process that can generate an unlimited supply of completely novel drug-like molecules. And it's not a static database. It's a dynamic molecule creation engine. I can point it to any part of the ocean and make as much as I want. I don't have to test the same things for every program that I start, okay? So this is the first step part. This is how we are creating the chemical options or the chemical space that I'm gonna explore. It's kind of like an expert system, if you will. All the knowledge base of chemists that have been built up over the last 100 years, you turn those into algorithms, and then you can replicate them a zillion times on your computer to make as many of these as you need. Then come the next part. This time, you have to figure out if you picked any one of these chemical scaffolds from your uh, ocean of possibilities that you've constructed, what will it look like in 3D? How will it actually flex and twist around these chemical bonds? How will the protein in question, for which we are trying to find the drugs, flex? How will water chaperone the interaction between the two? This is where accuracy becomes key. It's a fiendishly complicated problem that has hamstrung the field for the last 30 years. It's not some secret that this is how, the, uh, in the future, we should be designing drugs, except it's an incredibly hard problem. If you can break that accuracy barrier, you can run against any protein, this vast array of possibilities, to come up with sort of perfect custom design binders. Now, we showed many different you know, chemical options being tested against the protein. How many calculations do you think it took for, uh, to figure out if any one of these is a good binder? Trillions. On the other hand, just having compute power doesn't help you because you need to know which trillion calculations to make. That's where the physics breakthroughs come in. If you can combine those, now you have a process for completely changing drug discovery. I, I want to point out something. Uh, the, I think this panel has a lot of focus on AI. This is not AI, actually. Uh, if you uh, think about what AI is good at, you have a training set, you train on it, and then you know, it predicts other things that are similar. You're com designing completely something new. Your training sets don't help you. Your experimental data is not going to help you. Okay? What we're doing, doing here is hardcore molecule engineering. You hear about nanotechnology? This is beyond nano. We literally design novel molecules atom by atom on the computer, and then we make them in the lab and carry them forward through testing. So, now come the next part. You now have hundreds of custom design binders, things you couldn't find with current methods. If you're lucky at a Pfizer lab, you'd find one hit through high throughput screen. Here, I have hundreds of families of these things. Uh, these get sent to our chemistry lab, where their job is to make them quickly and send them off to our biology folks uh, to advance them uh, through all the rest of the testing and decide which ones should be uh, taken to the clinic. Well, let's talk about the chemistry part for a moment. All of these molecules represent completely novel IP, not like Vioxx versus Bextra, little tweaks, you know, you're trying to get a tippy toe around somebody else's patent estate. So, uh, and if our biologists like particular families, you know, really uh, a lot, and they want to optimize them further, the computer comes with, uh, to help with the process, and very quickly, we end up with multiple candidates that are ready for the clinic. So let's talk about the laboratory processes. <laughs> Our molecule creation engine gives you the full, full synthetic recipe for make, making each one of these. So we have a smooth, streamlined process for making them. Then they come back for biological testing. And what would you want to do at this point? You want to verify in the lab that they actually uh, work like you predicted, which ones are the most potent, which ones are the most selective. 
uh, meaning they won't bind to other proteins. Why do drugs fail in the clinic, in clinical trials? Because they bind to other proteins in your body. That's what causes side effects. Uh, so I'll use a lock and key analogy. Let's say the drug is the key that you are looking for that fits a lock, the protein in your body. You found a master key that opens every door in this building. That's not very good. You want something that only opens this door. So it could be curing your lung disease, but not killing your liver or your you know, kidneys or something else. Okay. So you run them through other batteries of in vitro, test tube uh, tests. And then you run them through animal tests to figure out how they're absorbed, distributed, metabolized, how toxic they are. And at this stage, the entire philosophy of traditional drug discovery completely changes forever. Why? Because if you're lucky at a, a Pfizer lab, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse pointer, maybe you have this guy. Now, people will point out you know, uh, that they won't have any of these molecules because they're completely novel. They wouldn't have uh, had them in their libraries. But for argument's sake, let's say they have this molecule. What they're going to do is spend the next four years trying to move it towards the center. As I said, replace the chlorine with the fluorine. Make small little changes, hoping that it'll give, give it better selectivity. Maybe they'll lose potency. One by one, they're going to try to satisfy all these different criteria. And guess what? Two thirds of the time, they find nothing. Our problem is not what to keep, but what to throw away. If a team takes two or 300 shots on goal in a match, whatever your favorite sport is, soccer, hockey, doesn't matter, right? And each shot has two to 3% you know, chance of getting in, you score a half a dozen goals without trying very hard, right? So this is why people like John Leonard, who is uh, to be the chief science officer for AbbVie, and before that for a decade, you know, ran Abbott's R&D organization. He says, this is the first time drug discovery becomes a routine, systematic, industrial engineering process. And make no mistake, to get here required a lot of fundamental science to be solved. And this now allows us to, for every program we start, take multiple candidates into the clinic every time. This is unthinkable in the current pharma paradigm. And that completely changes what you can do with modern medicine. Uh, let me show you what is possible with something like this, a uh, process like this. We have started using our platform over the last uh, few years to start rolling out our initial pipeline of drug candidates. We have drugs that treat this massive indication of heart attacks and strokes uh, and have really low bleeding risk. We have drugs that treat uh, vision loss in diabetes. Diabetes, if you have long, uh, diabetes for long enough, you lose your vision. Okay. And uh, we actually treat the root you know, inflammatory cause of the disease, uh, but we can treat it, unlike with today's uh, uh, treatments, which are monthly injections in the eye, with just a pill. Okay. We have novel treatments for, uh, treatments for some uh, uh, what's called an orphan disease that uh, afflicts one out of every 50,000 people. Uh, but the treatment cost annually is like $300,000 a year. We can completely change that. Uh, with, uh, these people have non-allergic swelling, and uh, that can be life-threatening if, if, if their air tracts swell up. We have tr uh, treatments for cancer. Uh, and we'll t I'll uh, touch upon some of these in the next few slides. Okay? So, Atrial fibrillation is this most common form of slight heart flutter that a huge percentage of the human population develop as we age past, you know, 60, 65, okay? Uh, the 33 and a half million patients in the developed world that you see over there, that doesn't count, you know, India, China, Brazil, you know, uh, Russia, any of those places, okay? And these are the very ad severe advanced forms of AF where they really must be treated is the number. Uh, the real number of other people uh, that could use treatment is much, much bigger. Then you have this thing called coronary artery disease. Have any of your friends and family gone to the doctor and gotten this carotid artery test to see how hard, uh, if your arteries are hardening up? You probably know somebody in your uh, friends and family who have had, had to do that, right? That's an even bigger population. With our modern diet and everything else, this problem you know, has ballooned up to be absolutely ridiculous. Now guess what? These people need to be put on an aspirin or a Plavix. Okay, which is an antiplatelet drug that affects you know, activation of these small little uh, blood cells uh, in, in your bloodstream uh, uh, called platelets. These guys need an anticoagulant which prevents actual clots from forming. Yes, uh, and you can probably guess why this you know, little Venn diagram overlap is there. These people need both, except you cannot give it to them. They'll you know, uh, basically bleed to death. 
and you have one other category called acute coronary syndrome, <laughs> patients who are at heavy risk of you know, uh, sudden heart attacks, you know, strokes, other things like those, uh, for all kinds of other causes, uh, they, they fall in this category. If you connect all of this up, this is, just in the developed world, at least 30 million patients. They need lifelong therapy, and there is nothing that can help them today. So we have drugs that can uh, prevent these clots from forming, but guess what? They don't increase the bleeding risk. If you look at healthy mice, you know, clip off the very tips of their tails under anesthesia, and you see how much they bleed. And they bleed a little bit, and the bleeding stops. You treat them with the same drugs that we, uh, we're giving humans, Eliquis from Pfizer, Pradaxa from you know, Beringer Ingelheim, and they're literally bleeding out to death. The amount of bleeding with Eliquis is like 1.2 billion blood cells. It doesn't stop. Okay? Here are our drugs. Time and a half to two X more than normal. And not just one, but many, many choices. When we show this to doctors, they say, when can we start prescribing these drugs? And you know, our first set of you know, candidates are going to the clinic in a couple of months, and it'll completely change the paradigm for uh, what you can do for these you know, uh, massive population of heart disease patients. I mentioned uh, vision loss in the diabetics. All you have are these repurposed cancer therapies today. Okay? They're given as uh, injections into the eye, and they treat the symptoms. Half of the patients that get them so no, see no improvement. The other half see marginal improvement, and they plateau at some point. Okay? But they keep going back for these uh, injections because they're desperate. They're going blind. Uh, there is another protein called calacrin. Uh, if you can go after it, it can treat the inflammatory cause of the disease much better. Uh, but even that, all, of you, all people have found are injections in the eye. Our drugs, you can deliver as eye drops or, you know, as uh, basically a pill that you take once a day. Guess what? Uh, uh, from where you're sitting, you probably can't see it very well, uh, but this is the back of the eye. The picture that your you know, eye doctor might take you know, uh, in their office. And uh, what you see with diabetic animals is, uh, is that after four weeks of diabetes, you know, uh, rapidly progressing diabetes, the back of their uh, eyes are very, very blurry. You know, it's starting to leak, uh, actually. Uh, the blood vessels are leaking. What happens with us is you know, the, uh, that leakage com uh, can be completely stopped. Over here, you know, the best you can probably tell is all these lines are, you know, a little fuzzy, and the back of the eye, uh, 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 eye has more of the uh, red stuff. It's because, you know, it's starting to leak blood. And uh, w with our drugs, you can completely stop that with a pill. Uh, and let's talk about cancer. Males of the human species, if we live long enough, one out of two, of us will develop cancer. Uh, for women, it's one out of three. Okay, those are pretty crazy odds. And what's the baseline therapy? You all know, have, might have heard about things like immunotherapy, uh, all kinds of things that are coming along. People say these are really great advancements in cancer. But you know what? Even when you give them those immunotherapy drugs or other things like those, what's the baseline therapy you always start them on that you always have you know, continuing? It's chemotherapy. It's, uh, you need that for everything else to act on top. What's the dreaded news that you know, every cancer patient's you know, family uh, never wants to hear? The drug has stopped working. That's what happens. Two, three months in, for a huge percentage of patients, that's what uh, uh, starts happening. Why? The tumor mutates and uh, starts producing too much of uh, these so-called transporter proteins that literally grab the drug and pump it out. At that point, no matter what you're giving, it's, uh, it's not doing anything because you know, even if it's getting inside the tumor cells, it's just pumping it right out. Our drugs, these transporter proteins, can't seem to be able to grab. So uh, they can't pump them out. The only other way they can develop you know, resistance is the protein you're going after that actually uh, prevents the tumor cells from replicating and, and then eventually die, right? If that mutates itself, so your drug no longer binds in that pocket. Remember those pictures we showed, right? Now it's all starting to make sense. Uh, our drugs, even for the typical mutations, they continue to work. 
So uh, look at what happens. Vincristin is one of the big chemotherapy drugs. There, is, there are others like Taxol. We have shown the same kind of results. Uh, what you see here, this is you know, the only uh, graph of this type you know, I'm showing in this presentation. Uh, down here is the concentration you need of the drug. Uh, uh, and up, up in the y-axis is the number of cells that are still alive. Okay? So as you increase the concentration at some point, you expect all of them to start dying. Okay? What you see with these uh, resistant cell lines is that at some point, with the cell, resistant cell lines, basically you have to increase the concentration by 4,000-fold before you, know, you see any effect. Of course, you can't give 4,000 uh, 4, times the concentration to a patient. You would have killed them a long, long time ago, right? Look at ours. Yes, there is a shift. That shift is like, whatever, 2x, which is completely fine. And it continues to work. So that is a, an incredible new tool in the oncologist's arsenal. Uh, you, you might have all heard about how you know, people lament uh, about the development of new antibiotics, how we are running into this uh, cliff where new antibiotics are not coming out, so many uh, diseases are now mutating, and we can't treat them. You know what? When it comes to cancer therapy, chemotherapy, we have seen even less innovation in the last 30 to 40 years. And all of these kinds of things you cannot find if you can't fish in the deep ocean. Uh, the parts of the chemical space that so far has been completely unexplorable uh, using current methods. And computers and automation and predictive modeling has changed industry after industry. The pharma industry is long overdue. And that's what you know, all of these kinds of new methods of uh, using predictive design and modeling and physics-based uh, uh, approaches can do. There, there is uh, applications even of AI uh, later down the stream on how you manage the development process, how you optimize these drugs, how you, you know, uh, quickly find you know, patterns in your clinical trials. And we're doing all of that as well. Uh, and this is an ecosystem that has to grow. And many of you, I hope, will join in this process. Uh, we. Uh, try to always remind ourselves why we come to work every day, why we get up at 2 in the morning to you know, uh, do a call with, you know, with Europe or whatever else, because this actually matters. Uh, when somebody we know or love you know, is sick, really uh, getting them better is the only thing that matters, and matters, nothing else. And this kind of transformation in medicine will make a real impact on all of our lives and on global health. So that's uh, my talk. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes? So how far are you in the, uh, the commercial availability of these So, uh, our first, we took about 12 plus years to build all of the core science behind this. Now, over the last few years, we have started using our platform to roll out our drugs. The first one is just entering clinic. We expect probably another four to five years before the first drugs from our you know, pipeline start hitting the market. In the meantime, we're continually building up. We already have four programs. Uh, we, are, you know, we have just started two more, and we'll continue to build up. The uh, point is, with these kinds of methods, you expect to, uh, to basically build a conveyor belt that can roll out drugs at a steady pace. Uh, in, in the not too distant future, we expect to be able to match any big pharma pipeline and in time pa surpass them. So. Thank you. So you're generating. Hello. You're generating all of these via computers, right? The models, the initial models. Sure. Is there any uh, failure in converting them into, you know, actual chemicals because is there, or is there a guarantee that whatever models you have built will get generated into real chemicals and will be able to be manufactured in large quantities in order to make the drug? Uh, that's a very good question. Are you from this industry? Uh, our, you know, pharma, and, uh, you know, uh, I remember uh, Bob Carr who used to run Pfizer's $8 billion a year R&D budget. He had just retired and he had heard our story. He came and said, how do I personally invest in your company? Okay, this was a long time ago. And uh, he told me, oh, if you can make even 30% of the mo novel molecules you're uh, uh, trying to design, that'll be great. We said, Bob, just relax. Don't worry, they'll be makeable. And I'll tell you 
that we have had a lot of oh crap moments along the, <laughs> along the way. But now, anything we design, yes, we can make them. Okay, yes. um, just one question. So thanks, Aditya, for the educational talk. Uh, what's your, uh, so does your business model involve actually manufacturing the drugs or licensing the technology to other uh, large manufacturers? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, we started this company, we come from the high tech world, okay? Uh, and we started this company thinking that this will be like EDA for drugs. You, uh, how many of you know EDA? Electronic design automation for you know, chip design, whatever else, right? And we'll just sell the tools to everybody. Turns out, in this business, uh, the dynamics are completely different. There are, there are a few players, big pharmaceutical companies. You don't get to sell to everybody and his cousin. Uh, you can't really uh, share in the upside of these uh, drugs that could be making $15 billion a year. You just sell a tool. And it makes no sense. Uh, the fi uh, financial world analogy would be, if you have figured out how to make uh, 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 quant trading algorithms that consistently beat the market, you don't go sell it to Goldman Sachs or somebody else or some hedge fund manager. You build your own hedge fund and print your own money. So in this business, the best way to monetize something that you're building is to build the pharmaceutical company of the future. Thank you, everybody.